Hello, I'm Alan Metcalf and this is Conversations and in this conversation I'm speaking with Lester Morris. Lester's a, um, a theatre guy out of Sydney who writes books and has a lifelong passion with motorcycles. Hey Lester, how are you my friend? I'm kicking on well, thanks. How are you going, Alan? Yeah, thanks for talking to us, Lester. I, uh, I'm fascinated to hear about your new book. I, when is it out? When's it coming out? It looks as it's being laid out now. About half of it's actually laid out, and the photographs have gone through and some captions. Right. Probably, I would think, early November. Um, okay. It's got to go away. It's got to be finished yet and go away and be published and come back and all that sort of stuff. So I would think early November. Yeah, Lester, you've been writing and gathering information for a long time about this, to preparing for this book. Tell me about it. What's the background to it? Well, the background is that um, I joined the motorcycle trade almost straight from <coughs> school after serving time as a telegram messenger boy. I joined the motorcycle trade in 1948. I bought my first motorcycle in 1947. I was only 14 years old and I wasn't supposed to do this, but I made some money selling newspapers on and off the trams in William St. King's Cross. Uh -huh. It's a motorcycle. Um, I wasn't allowed <laughs> to ride it, but now and again, there's no one listening, is there? I rode it occasionally when there was nobody around. Shh. <laughs> uh, but I joined the trade in So you're a telegram boy up at King's Cross <laughs> in Sydney. My goodness, what an well, experience. Uh, it was different though in 1947, and during the war, I might say, it was a wharfside suburb, Woolloomooloo, uh -huh. where all the ships used to come in. I sold newspapers on the ships as well, on things like the Indefatigable, some of the big aircraft carriers from England and America. Right. That was really an experience as well, let me tell you that. But uh -huh. um, I had a passion for motorcycles, which was, I suppose, begun in when I was still at school, because on the way to school was a fellow who now and again could sell you two little chocolate Montes okay. in a white paper bag if he ate them before he got to school, because he wasn't supposed to have them. So these were biscuits? These Choc were biscuits. Oh, yes. Chocolate yeah, Montes, okay. <laughs> but he had, a, he had a motorcycle parked in the, in the gutter outside his shop, which was, I didn't know what it was at the time, <clears> the 1932 <throat> Square 4 Aerial, 500cc with the four cylinders in a square formation. I thought it was great. So uh, I sat on it a couple of times and <laughs> shoved it around here and then sort of fiddled around with the thing. And the passion came from nowhere. Is that uh, right? From nowhere. But I stayed in the trade then in no fewer than six motorcycle firms um, for the best part of 20 years and bothered to study the design, the different uh, uh, engines, the different types of suspension systems, not only of road-going motorcycle, but racing motorcycle as well. Right. And, yeah, so that's where it sort of started. Right. Um, and that's nearly <coughs> 70 years ago. Because you've been a commentator, have you not? Oh, on, yes. On a lot of the race tracks and... Oh, yes. It, I, I began commentating... Whereabouts? Phillip Island and races. places? I'm sorry, I began commentating motorcycle races in the early 60s at Bathurst. Oh, okay. Uh, initially down at the control tower and also, uh, uh, without knowing this, over radio through uh, through uh, a 2BS and, two, and uh, 2GB as well. Okay. Um, and I did that on and off for 20 years, but I pursued a parallel career in theatre and television, so uh, I did quite a few of those meetings at Bathurst um, from the early 60s until into the 80s, but... I would miss the occasional Easter because I was touring with a show somewhere. Right. And also I did... Um, so is that like the Bathurst, the big car race, they used to do motorbikes, or they still do motorbikes up there? Oh, no, 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 no. It, it, the, the circuit itself was considered to be one of the greatest racing motorcycle racing circuits on earth. Two others, uh, Clermont Ferrand in France and Solitude in Germany, were similar circuits. They were considered to be the three finest circus of their type in the world. It was a magnificent track, no doubt about it. Wow. But these days, see, there's no... Are you getting into trouble? I've done this. Getting into trouble on the mountain up at the top. Right. And there's nowhere to go. There's no runoff. There's nowhere to go. So with modern motorcycles, they are so fast, 
Right. That you could be getting hit all sorts of strife on Bathurst, so hey, it's gone unfortunately, but I believe that they are now redesigning another track that takes in part of Mount Panorama for motorcycles and it's being surveyed now. It'll be built, we hope, in the next sort of little while. Yeah, well, it's a great... Uh, it's become a great car racing circuit, oh, hasn't oh, it? It's a magnificent... Mount Panorama is uh, famous almost worldwide. worldwide. Yep. Yeah. And, but you do Phillip Island and places like that? Have you been no, down there? No, I haven't done Phillip Island. I, uh, when they started getting the international races through... Uh, as, a, as an actor, sort of comic, I'm able quite happily to, to ad-lib through most of a day's racing. Um, <laughs> but when I rang them to say, hey, I was available if they wanted me to assist, the fella rang me a few days later and said, oh, you could join my motorcycle um, commentator's school. Uh -huh. We might start you in a small track somewhere in the bush. <laughs> and and I thought, come on. I mean, come on, geez. for a, black, a guy like Lester Morris to go out in the bush. <laughs> well, Mate, hey. you're, a, you're a King's Cross guy. <laughs> well, I suppose. Uh, well, <clears throat> King's Cross in You're centre of the action, man. No, in those days, I could go in King's Cross, <laughs> a very big cinema. You used to have movies uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Right. And they changed from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they'd have double features. Now, I could go up there couple of nights of the week at 14, 15 years of age, walk home again through all the little back alleys. I wouldn't go out there today with 10 of my mates. Right. Because it has changed so much over all those years. Pretty harmless in sure. those days, let me tell you. Well, Sydney's an incredibly big city today. And oh. Oh. Tell us about some of the the, the theatre theater stuff you did, Lester. Well, I got my training. Um, it's almost a parallel career with writing. I've been writing feature articles, road test reports, uh, humorous uh, columns, technical articles for 50 years for motorcycling. Right. And I joined Actors' Equity in 1968 um, after spending from 51 to, 50 to 68 learning my craft in amateur theatre. Let me right. promise you, I learnt my craft through some very fine directors and musical directors. Right. So that when it came time for me to walk onto the stage of the Theatre Royal in Sydney right. and sing two songs in front of a, the top Broadway director. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, can you be in Melbourne on Monday to start rehearsals? Uh -huh. I, thought, I thought I was going to pass out. I couldn't believe it. Is that right? Oh, I'm standing centre stage. I, uh, I couldn't breathe. My, my <laughs> palms were sweaty. My throat was dry. <laughs> my heart was thumping like a jackhammer. And to walk off stage, the corner to walk off stage was half a mile away. I thought I'd never get off stage. Right. I got a year's touring Adelaide, Sydney. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, Sydney. And since then, I've been in theatre and television almost full time, whatever that means. So what, would there be any shows that people would remember? Well, I'm, I'm I've got a TV commercial running now for Helga's Bread, of all things. Hell's That's running right now on television, right. as, we, as we speak, uh, t sort of uh, early into September 2016. Um, and I've done all the Crawford black and white epics where I was in Melbourne working in theatre, uh -huh. and um, Home and Away, Sons and Daughters, Country Practice, uh, Rafferty's Rule, did all of those things, yes. Everybody knows all those uh, shows. Oh, yes. and, and at the turn of the century, you didn't get them in Brisbane because they're mostly in New South Wales, we filmed eight commercials for Energy Australia where this short guy was too small to change his light globe. <laughs> and this big seven foot tall guy came out to do it. It worked so well, the short man, I'm only five foot three, 1.6 metres. So this guy was nearly seven foot tall. So the gag worked so well, they did eight of these commercials following the same theme. <laughs> and, and Can we break there, Lester? Can we break there? I've got to take a break. Like We're up against this hard technical stop situation I know, I know. and uh, okay. we'll be back in a minute do you stick with us i'll do it thanks so much Thank, yes. we'll be back in a minute lester good lad i'm talking with lester morris and uh, lester um, has got a great new book coming out we're going to talk about that book in the next sector stick with us we'll be back in a moment i'm alan metcalf
Well, Mr. Colgan, oh, how are you going? Good. Uh, you called? What seems to be the problem? Yeah, I think it's the um, uh, fuse box. Uh -huh. That way? That way, mate. Okay, yep. great. No, oh, it's fine. Well, maybe it's the uh, wiring in the roof. Could be. <sighs> yep, just a new wire needed up here, that's all. Mm. So, everything's okay then? Oh, great. Oh, oh, you've blown a globe. Have I? Yeah. You want me to change it for you while I'm here? Sure. Okay. There Who'd have the energy to respond to calls 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and at a competitive price? Oh. Who's in the box? Betty. Betty. Your wife. Oh. Well. I hope we're going to die in our sleep. Together. How many times have I told you, Mary? It's not going to happen unless we make it happen. But isn't that a sin, Ray? Not at our age. Where's a cup of tea, Mary? Wasn't it nice to see Joan and Coral? <sighs> no, it was not nice. John did another fall and broke a hip. It's not a bloody competition. Ah, oh, Pat, you're just having a bad day. Every day's a bad day. It's only going to get worse. I don't want to wake up one day in a bloody nursing home. Just because your brother's got dementia doesn't mean you will. Me? Me? You'll get it before I do. Me? Why? I specifically asked for coffee and you bought me tea. You do that sort of thing all the time. Next you'll be strolling the streets naked at two o'clock in the morning. It's very popular. One has to procure it in Mexico. Mexico? Mexico? People kill themselves all the time. They don't always go all the way to Mexico to do it. You can't bring it into the country. Hey, we'd have to get passports. Well, it's not for everyone. Here. What's this? They're the suicide bags. You can order them over the internet, but I've made ours with oven bags. Oven bags? What am I, a roast chook? Oh, Ray, this is the most romantic thing we've ever done together. You were quite right. Going together our way. Put it on. Go on, put it on. If your head's too big, I'm going to have to alter it. We can't risk a leak now, can we? I've got a funny feeling in my stomach. Oh, Ray. So do I. Well, I've cancelled the phone, the electricity, and the gas. I don't feel well. It's just nerves, dear. Now, I think the sideboard should go to Helen, not Jane. But perhaps Andrew would like it. What do you think, dear? You're not listening, Mary. I'm not well. We can't go. But I've called the cab. Well, cancel it then. I'm not well. Ray, we're going to kill ourselves. You don't have to be well. What about Vivian and Charles? Maybe you've got cancer? Oh, Mary. Well, what about my dementia running naked through the street? Don't be ridiculous. You haven't got dementia. But I want to go to Mexico. Well, Mary, it's not all about what you want. Oh. How's Who's that? supplying electricity and gas to lots of Australians, including Lem McGrath? G'day, Mr Colgan. Oh. Got one of these? Uh, no, thanks. Come in, come oh, in. Uh, better get back. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Energy Australia. I don't believe it, Glenda Lake. Yeah, and they say he was wearing her dressing gown. Big Jim's too busy making money to do anything else. He just likes the idea of being MP. Yeah, but if you want to get something done, give it to the busy man, and he'll make the time to do it. Oh, what if old Mr Potts didn't go to the park every day with his breadcrumbs to feed the pigeons? Hmm? We have a couple of thousand birds flying around looking for a new town to live in, and that's not such a little thing. <laughs> Ever. Hello, I'm Alan Metcalf, and we're back talking with Lester Morris in Sydney, Australia. 
and Lester's telling us about his new book that he's about to publish later this year. Hey, Lester, you're still there with us? I'm still here, lad, yep, yep. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, Lester. Hey, Lester, what's the name of this book? It's called Vintage Morris. Vintage Morris. What Vintage, an, what and, a, the, and the subheading is Tall Tales But True right. from a Lifetime in Motorcycling. That's what it is. Okay, so, so every a, motorcycle buff will have yes. fun reading this book. Yeah, well, it's it, what it's about quite simply is that I've been writing humorous articles, technical articles, as I think I've mentioned before, road tests and race reports for Motorcycle Magazine since about 1968, that's nearly 50 years. But I've also written what Peter Toming, the bear as they call him, Peter Toming uh, refers to as short stories. Right. And they go way back to, they weren't written in 47, they go right back to 1947. I've collated them um, chronologically mm -hmm. so that that then becomes uh, a series of memoirs because wow. so many people have said, when are you going to write your memoirs? Well, this is precisely what it is. So this is the, the life story of Lester Morris. Yeah, yeah, in motorcycle. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's about 76 of these. You showed us, you showed me before, Lester, and we got, we got it on the screen now, a great cover. Oh, you, yeah. you've, got a, you've, got, you've got a... Uh, <laughs> You've got an artist to develop this incredible cover. Oh, it's marvellous. Is that Mar your wife in the sidecar? No, that's my wife driving the thing. That's, that's your wife the, driving it. <laughs> what I stupidly did in 1955... Right. I, I decided to teach her how to drive an Indian motorcycle outfit. Right. And, and I made the mistake of assuming that she would be gentle at the controls. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, She's only got she two not. speeds, dead flat out and stop, eh? Flat out and stop. In, <laughs> in fact, we'd come down this, it's in the, the story's in the book. Right. And that's what this, see, Brendan Ackhurst actually did the cartoon, did some for other stories, a brilliant cartoonist, as you can see. Yeah, what it is, captured, it's wonderful artwork. And what is, <laughs> what is captured is a moment I thought we were dead. Right. Because we came down this narrow gutted road, went mm. down onto a little bridge that said no passing or overtaking at all. It was only <laughs> wide enough for two push bikes to pass. Mm. Little narrow gutted, little rustic bridge. Right. We came up to the thing and a fellow was just beginning to drive his Ford Prefect onto the bridge and instead oh, of breaking, goodness. she opened the throttle to the stop. <laughs> and we leapt onto this bridge. <laughs> I, I still can't believe it. Leapt onto this bridge. <laughs> And the poor fellow driving the car shoved it into reverse, back down a, a gully, and as she drew alongside him, she shouted over her shoulder, silly old bugger. <laughs> and, and there's a tight left-hander going off the bridge. The sidecar wheel hit the grass bank, lifted it a meter off the, uh, in the air, which gave her another meter of road to use. She shot me out the corner, and, and her sister was screaming, so was I. <laughs> um, and she stopped it and said, no harm done. I, how she did look it was divine intervention. There it you was, are. It had to be. So it made you made a believer out of you at that, that yeah, <laughs> after I, that. I, I fell to my knees. <clears throat> I, it made look. It was divine. It couldn't be anything else. Couldn't have been anything else. Yeah. yeah. Driven yeah, yeah. a car, much less ridden a. So a, your a, wife. How long have you been married, Lester? Well, uh, this one thirty years actually. Right. Um, She's my current wife, and she's my strong right arm. <laughs> um, if I'd met her all those years ago, I wouldn't have the trouble with all the others. <laughs> uh, but uh, There you but, are. And then these are all two stories. There's true stories of so many incidents that happened in the trade and on the way to Bathurst and on the way to other places like that. Right. Because somebody asked me once, when are you going to write your memoirs? Right. Well, this is what they are. This is the memoirs, eh? Yeah. So, <clears throat> apart from the incident of going across the bridge and Lily running into the Ford Prefect, what? Tell us another good story. Come on, tell us one. Well, what's another interesting well, I'll story? Well, tell you the another book. story that's in there that you won't believe because I didn't either. Right. I was there, 1953. Right. I was riding a motorcycle to Bathurst, coming through Yetholm in the fog. Right. I could hear this roaring sound coming up behind it. And I thought it was an aircraft in trouble, and it get closer and closer, and I pulled to the side of the road, I didn't know what, what was happening, and a motorcycle outfit came past me, and on the platform where the sidecar would be was a racing motorcycle, 
Good well, the fellow sitting on the pillion seat, and behind it was a racing outfit with a bar between them, which was pushing the other bike because it was a, it was on uh, it was a, a full full power pushing the other bike, and a fellow sitting on the back of that, and another racing solo on the platform, and it was towing behind it on ropes two other fellows on on motorcycles. My goodness. What this was was the world's most illegal road train <laughs> taking four racing solos and a racing outfit and all the riders and everything to Bathurst. Now, that was what Bathurst was about. This is 1953 in amateur days. Goodness. This was, this was the charm of Bathurst, mate, let me tell you, because everybody stayed in the same pubs and it was the most fantastic camaraderie. In the, it really was. Yeah. Nowadays, it's so <clears throat> professional that they hardly speak to one another. So how many people would com compete in an event like that in those days? You, you'd have had about... It was hard work in the mountain box because you'd have, say, 140 in a race sometimes. 40? Wow, that's great. 140. 140? Yep, and you'd have wow. 20 of them go past at once. So you had to tell everybody on the other side of the circuit on that first lap who they were, Goodness. what they were riding, what Goodness. they had for breakfast, her girlfriends... <laughs> uh, uh, well, not, let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> So you had to be entertaining as well. Sure. And they would come through me, fill me park corner, onto the top of the S-Bends at Skyline at 120 miles an hour. Wow. That's, that's 200 kilometres an hour. So you really had to be able to ad-lib and be so quick on your feet. It was really, right. it was really a challenge. Yeah, no, that's good training. That's good training. Oh, so <clears throat> what sort of crowds would it attract, those events? They reckon around 30,000. 30,000, even yep. in those days, eh? Not bad. That's pretty first, good, isn't it, for Outback Australia? Not bad. I first went to Bathurst in 1948. That's in the book as well. Right. We didn't know at the time that there was a migrant hostel at Bathurst. Right. So when we got on the train, the paper train at Central Station, we were the last on the train because of people jumping in through the windows and pushing people aside. I stood up nose to nose with five garlic-breathing foreigners <laughs> all the way to Bathurst, I promise you. <laughs> Uh, where we fell out of the train and relieved ourselves with steam everywhere. Now, this was Bathurst in 1948. We had our push bikes in the guards' van. And let me tell you right. this. Okay, this is 1948. This is what it was like. There were two bikes in the guards' van. One of them was a Velocet from Sydney. The other, get this, was a 250cc Triumph motorcycle from Perth. Wow. This guy had booked himself on his bike to go from Perth to Kalgoorlie, Kalgoorlie to to Port Augusta, Port Augusta, to Adelaide, Adelaide to Melbourne, Melbourne to Albury, Albury to Sydney, Sydney to Bathurst. That's a keen motorcyclist. Took him over two weeks to do it. What a story. Now, that was what it was sure. like, Alan. Sure, and in those days, the roads weren't what they are today. Uh -huh. Let me tell you. <laughs> you didn't have the India Pacific train, mate. You had to change it, you know, every sure. half. Sure. No, interesting, interesting, fascinating days. Lester, let's uh, let's stop again for another break. Yep. And um, we'll be back and we'll tie up uh, everything in the last segment. Can Good you hang, hang hang with us for a moment? Good on you, Alan. All the best, Thank mate. you. We'll be back in a moment, Lester. Thank you. Sure thing. Yep. I'm Alan Metcalf, and uh, I'm talking with Lester Morris about his new book that's out, which is a lifetime of stories about his involvement with motorcycles. We'll be back in a moment. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Higgins, and welcome to Safe Worlds TV, the global marketplace, the world leader in internet TV and semantic search, the home of free enterprise, the level playing field that all the world can use for electronic business. With Safe Worlds TV, every business in every country of the world can now be involved in the world economy. There are no barriers to entry. Even the poorest countries and the smallest businesses can be involved. The system is simple. Every country divides into 12 headline channels. Every channel is a gateway to an unlimited number of related community channels. 
Every community is a social network and a marketplace to sell products and services. There is no limit to the number of businesses that can be connected into a marketplace. There is no limit to the number of products you can sell. All our channels and marketplaces are designed to keep you entertained and to help you do internet business at a cost that everyone can afford. The amazing semantic technology that underpins SafeWorlds TV allows us to deliver this amazing system to the world. It allows us to accommodate millions of TV channels and marketplaces and to link them together into the global marketplace. The vast global marketplace that we are building is the final piece of the electronic global village. This is the ultimate achievement of the internet. What you see here now is only the tip of the iceberg of semantic services that are coming. Come now and see what we've already got. Choose any country of the world, then select the headline channel that you want to explore. Just point and click and follow the logical tree structure. We think you'll be amazed at what we already have in Safe Worlds TV. When you're ready, click on the button at the bottom of the screen and register to become a user. You can start immediately to create your very own internet TV channel. Enjoy the experience. I'm Paul Higgins for Safe Worlds TV. This is Alan Metcalf, and uh, we're doing conversations on Safe Worlds TV. And I'm talking with Lester Morris. Lester's a uh, playwright, uh, a thespian. He's an actor. He's a he's a motorcycle guy out of Sydney, Australia. And Lester's got a new book coming out later this year called Vintage Vintage Morris. I was going to say Vintage Australia. It almost is the story of Australia, Lester's incredible life in Australia. Get a look for it when it comes out and get a copy. I think you'll find it fascinating. Lester, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here, mate, yes. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks for talking to us, Lester, and mm. being patient. And um, Hey, I wanted to ask you a, yep. a little bit more about the acting side of your life. Yep. Because... As a creative person, writing and on stage and all of that, how, how did were you always a writer? No, I sort of fell into that almost by accident. Um, I just started to write. I did fairly well at school because in a composition competition with our school and many others in the area, uh -huh. I won a book for my composition on. I can't remember what it was. Right. So I managed to put words together in a reasonable, readable fashion. Right. Um, and when I started to write for Motorcycle Magazine, which as I said was in 1967, <coughs> that, which is nearly 50 years ago, yeah. I just progressed from there. Um, so you I, never did formal training as a journalist? No, 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 no. The only thing I've done any training for is uh, as a classic trained opera singer, as a tenor. And I've, my first singing lesson was in 1950. Right. And I had a run through with John May, one of the great tenors, about 18 months ago, who tightened a few things that had loosened up and loosened a few things that had gone tight. Uh -huh. And uh, at 83 years of age, I'm still singing, I think, as well as I was 40 years ago. Truly. Yeah. Yep. Unbelievable. Well, uh, last year, I, uh, for the Sydney Independent Opera Company, I directed a small opera and I compared the opera singer's gala concert. Right. And at the end of the first act, I sang a rousing duet with the principal baritone, which seemed to surprise everybody because I've directed them in opera. They've never heard me sing a, a, a note, so they were right. a bit surprised to did see. You ever, did you ever sing with any of the anyone we'd know? Any any of the big, big yeah? Singers? Well, yeah. I put together in 1975 uh, a Cornell Music Hall show in a motel in Albury, resting between engagements in television in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. 
And if I'd, sit, if I'd known you then, Alan, and I said to you, Alan, I'm going to put this music hall show together that's going to run for 32 years. Wow. You would have told me I was crazy, but Goodness. I put the thing to Sydney. I put Gordon Boyd in the chair, well-known television uh, present, uh, uh, presenter. Sure. He was in the chair for 14 years, and yeah. we had June Bronhill as a special guest at Twin Towns and mm -hmm. other clubs around the place. I've had some of the top singers, not always well-known, but great singers in it. Right. In fact, some people have said, what have you got John Maney for? He's a far better tenor than you. I said, hey, that's why he's in the thing. <laughs> because he is so good. Sure. Um, and why not? That's my that's my philosophy, what that's worth. Um, you like working with talented people? Oh, them? look, I, fo I followed June Brodenhill on stage several times and she absolutely captivated the entire audience. Twin Towns, 1,100 people per performance. Sure. They had to go on stage, or five foot three of me, and try to get them on my side. Now, that was, I thought, hard coming work, in, It's like but... coming in after Marilyn Monroe or somebody. <laughs> 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 Very nearly, um, yeah. but, but I've been fortunate, I suppose, because um, I've also directed Snow White Seven Dwarfs live on stage, which is stored in New Zealand right now, looking for a backup for its 50th anniversary. So the things that you do, that you just sort of do. Right. Well, that's theatre, that's, that's being creative, isn't it? It's, um, oh, yes. Some yes. people are bricklayers, some people are, you know, Commentators, all sorts of yep. people. Some well, people I, I, ride horses. Some people play football, and that's exactly right. Well, I said to my doctor yeah. when he did a knee replacement, I said, "Look, it must take courage to cut a knee open and glue all the bits and pieces in." I said, "I couldn't do that." He said, "Perhaps not," but he said, "If I was asked to sing a song in front of a thousand people, he said I would die." Yeah, sure. I, I said, "I can do it, and I do." That's uh, interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 like. Which is own, Alan? Beg your pardon. To each his own, mate. Oh yeah, I agree with you. It's um, it's interesting. We'd be a boring old world if we we're all the same. Oh, how dry that'd be, eh? wouldn't it? God. Without a couple of interesting characters like you and me, what a dumb world <laughs> it'd be. We should go on tour. We'd have a great double act, mate. I tell you that. Unbelievable, unbelievable. It'd be like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. The anyway, so. With 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 theatre, you you theatre went to television and did you and that's how you progressed. You did those television shows and yes, and and then I went into directing op I directed several operas for for Rockdale and for Sydney Independent. Right. Um, and discovered a few quite good young singers amongst them. Let me tell you that, and some mature, mature singers as well. Hmm. And it's a privilege to work with these people, to stand back and watch them and listen to the sound these people generate. Right. And some were born with great voices and they've just developed them. Others, like me, had nothing to start with and spent a lifetime working on the voice. So do you like still... directing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. It's great. Um, if you can get that performance out of people, it's, uh, uh, look, it's uh, great some... fun, isn't it? Well, it is. See, some opera singers don't realise they can actually move and sing at the same time. Right. Now, I've had them jumping through hoops. Um, <laughs> not, not literally, but... Right, I know what you say. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the action should not stop just because they're singing this glorious area of the magnificent right. sound. Right. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Right. And that's and the key to directing. Diction is... and final consonants. Beg your pardon? I'm a bit funny about diction and final consonants. I said to one of the singers once, I said, can you tell me, a girl, the difference between a kiss and a kick? Didn't know what <laughs> I said. Uh, I said, a kiss is a kiss and a kick is a kick. Right. You need the final consonant for the audience to know what they're singing about. Yeah, well, today you can't, you listen to singers oh. on the radio, you haven't got a clue what they're talking about. Don't go there, please. There's no diction at all, is there? No. It's, um, it's really interesting because we were, I was watching this new star woman, that's uh, the British woman. I forget what her name is now, but she's the... And the diction was beautiful. And mm, oh, yes. It, it makes a huge difference it with does. a singer if you can understand what they're talking about. That's exactly... I, I lecture them before <clears throat> I start, and I say, hey, listen, I'm very funny about this. Yeah. You've developed the tone, that Italian round sound, not the round sound, but the round sound. Yeah. And around it so much, people can't understand what you're singing about. 
Yeah, no, it's a lost art. It's oh. uh, they don't teach it at school anymore, and that's right. You know, it's elocution sort of lot gone, and yeah, you know, yeah. the meaning of words today, words mean nothing to people. They they throw them around and use them in so many, you know, silly ways. And absolutely. Well, I sing I sing these corny old tenor songs that nobody else sings. Right. They've got a melody. The words have got some meaning. Right. And even the younger kids in the audience, I say kids 20s and 30s, yeah, who yeah. don't want to listen to this stuff, I see them suddenly sit up and take notice because right. hopefully the voice is not too bad, but there's a melody and the sure. words have got some meaning. And the same thing with the words yeah. on, on the page of a book. Now, this book is going to be about 170,000 words, about yeah. 180 pages. Um, it'll probably come through, I imagine... Slightly under thirty dollars, a pretty reasonable price. Great. And uh, it will be going through my channel, Motorcyclists United, on Safe World. Fantastic. World well, that's, when when you've got it ready, give us a call, send me an, an email, and uh, we'll do another follow-up interview and uh, talk a little bit more about the book. Yep. Lester, yep. thanks for doing this. This is fun. It's been fun. Uh, yep. I hope people enjoy listening to it. Uh, let's catch up again. I'm Alan Metcalf, and uh, this is Conversations on Safe Worlds TV. We've been talking with Lester Morris. Tune in next time and listen to another great conversation. <laughs>